Oh, here we are. Testing. All right, let's get some people in here. We might repost this, so you're gonna see me. Hey everybody, Chris Luquette taking over Thompson Guitars Instagram, coming from you live, coming to you live from a bunker somewhere in Siberia. Um, I think, maybe. I don't know where I am. Anyway, do we know where we are? Hey, look, names coming in. All right, yeah. Welcome, welcome. My name is Chris Luquette. I am I'm from the band Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen. Hey, there's the thing. Let's see here. Let's see. Uh, go live. Bring him in here. Where is he? Come on, Instagram. What you got going on today, everybody? Hopefully you're safe and sound. Hey, look at this. My first time doing this, so we've got excitement. Oh, yep, gotta go. Gotta go top ways. Here. Okay. Do I hear you? I hear you fine. Gareth, how are you? Good morning, Chris. Hey, I hear you fine and dandy. Look at technology. I can figure this out. Yeah, you're better than me. That's for sure. Well. That's all right. That's why we let you build the guitars. I'll deal with the phones and okay, and you'd play them and figure it figure it all out. Yes. Well, I was just uh, tr trying to figure out a little introduction thing going on here because uh, maybe there's some folks who who know who you are don't know who I am. Who am I? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so big howdy to everybody who's joined in here. My name is Chris Luquette. Uh, I play with the band Frank Sullivan and uh, Dirty Kitchen. And uh, I play, this is probably going to take you by surprise. Oddly enough. Guitar. And I have the t-shirt to prove it, and it's backwards. I'm going to be left-handed today. I'm defying all styles of logic here. It's really amazing. So, and how do you, we got Gareth, Gareth, Jen Gareth Jenkins, cool. and I, I work for Thompson, and I'm uh, the person that does the uh, voicing of the instruments, and um, been with Started with Preston back in 2013, 2012. And I was just trying to remember this morning when you got your first guitar, when you connected with us. Was that 2013, Chris? Uh, I think it was either late 2013 or 2014. Um, okay. I think it was this one that, um, yeah. this is number 006. No, 105. 105 is what I've got here. That's how. And yeah, I think it was probably 2014 or so. And that's a funny story is um, uh, some people may not know this name. We know this name too well, actually. Uh, Steve Blanchard uh, <laughs> in Portland, Oregon uh, is a dear friend of both of ours. And I remember one time at the festival Wintergrass, he said, hey, Chris, you got to check this guitar out that some friends made. So I said, oh, okay. So he hands me a guitar much like this one, and I played a couple of chords, and I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And he said, well, it was made in Oregon, right next door to my home state of Washington. And I said, well, this is great. Like, awesome guitars being made in the Northwest, sign me up. So it was right around then, 2000, I'm gonna, I, I don't remember exactly when, because I just, I, I got so into guitar mode, but it was probably 2004. Yeah. Um, I think it was 2013 was Wintergrass, maybe, that, that February and uh, probably got yours about six months later, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, and I remember, what I do remember was um, Frank Sullivan Dirty Kitchen, we played Sisters Folk Festival. Yeah. Which, uh, Sisters, Oregon is close to where you're at, coming from, right? Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful central Oregon. There it is. We're blessed to live here. What a place the sun's to out, the mountains are out. Yeah. Those mountains? I think it's these. Those mountains. mountains right there. Yeah. Except they have snow on them, unlike those there. Right. Well, I want to welcome everybody that uh, we're just going to wing it here, but... Um, we're good at it. A, a year ago today, um, Preston Thompson passed away, and he was our mentor and our, our uh, captain of the ship, and um, just a little brief minute or so... Um, he started building guitars back in the 70s and uh, went to Charles Fox's school up in Vermont and uh, built quite a few guitars, eventually ended up at uh, Winfield National Flat Picking Championships and uh, connected with Peter Rowan there. He connected a little earlier with uh, Charles Sautel of Hot Rise, um, who gave him a lot of uh, several of his classic old vintage guitars who he, he was able to crawl inside and figure out how they were made and why they were so good and 
for all of you out there that appreciate good vintage guitars, uh, you know the difference in the sound between them and what's mostly made today. And so that's what he went after. He went after that sound and, uh, and build up through uh, beginning of the 80s, I guess, before he, uh, <laughs> as we say, got a big boy job and, um, and, and worked in some resorts for, uh, doing uh, promotions and did that for quite a long time until probably, I'm, I'm trying to remember, maybe 2010 or so when he got back into building. Um, so we're continuing on with his legacy of building those styles of instruments. We have a great staff of incredible uh, craftspeople, and we're continuing to build them in, in that tradition. And we can talk more about it later as we go along, but that's just a little intro. Well, that's the best intro. And you're right about Preston. Um, you mentioned that he crawled inside vintage guitars. And I've met a lot of people that are way into vintage guitars, uh, but Preston will always stand out in my memories being, I uh, keep wanting to use that word crawl. He, he could crawl inside. I guess. <laughs> and the history. Yeah, exactly. I remember being at the shop times and <clears throat> hours by with you and him and a few other folks, just like numbers flying, you know, D18, 28, triple O. Yeah. And, and just he my could tell you which, which week in 1933 that they ran out of Sitka spruce and they put some other little piece of wood <laughs> in there. You would know that. He was a historian. I, man, I, I love that. I love that, and I love that you guys are all uh, uh, contributing to that legacy, keeping it alive, because that's, that's it. And it kind of gets into this weird, bigger picture of, like, you know, the, the keeping the vintage guitar legacy alive. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a time. Well, we're, we're kind of a bridge between uh, what you're playing now and that 1937 uh, Martin that you really want. Uh, <laughs> right. We're getting as close as we can to that vintage sound. Um, I haven't figured out how to build in old yet, but I can do most of the other things and the guys in the shop can do, um, they can make them sound great. So until you can afford that 37 Martin, uh, this is where you go. <laughs> there it is, love it. Hey, speaking of the shop, uh, a shout out to everybody who's who's working there alongside you. Uh, what are some of those names? Um, Jason's hanging around, I know that. Yeah, Jason, uh, Peter back there in uh, Finnish. And uh, we got Joel and and uh, Jameson and in setup. Um, Caleb is. We only got a few more days, by the way. That's kind of new news to you, probably. But uh, Caleb's been our CNC um, tech for quite a few years. He's one of the older um, guys that's been there. Not that he's old, but um, and uh, so he's going to be moving on next week. Um, but he's leaving all his, uh, you know, programs and knowledge with some of the guys at the shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, Simon, who is our neck person and artist, is is still there. And uh, and Jake, who just started over in uh, the body department, he's there. And of course, Christine mm -hmm. in the office, uh, Dan, one of the owners, Julie, one of the old owners. Uh, special shout out to Julie and Piper Thompson today. We're all thinking about you today. There are. Yeah. Uh, I can vouch for every single one of those people that you mentioned. They're all friends. Like, I'm so, I'm very lucky. We, like, artists and musicians and guitar players, you know, very rarely do they get to meet the folks that craft the instrument. Um, and I'm, I'm super lucky that I've met everybody out there and count them all as friends. And something funny for uh, maybe some of the folks who've joined in here, uh, having been to the shops that many times, um, I've never been anywhere else where I've seen more band t-shirts or musical posters on the wall. <laughs> uh, and as a musician, I love that because yeah, there's the craft, there's the product, of course it's a product, but uh, the, you're making instruments. That's the thing. And to see it and to see like the few times we played, I've played gigs around your area um, and everybody from the shop coming out to the concerts and like, hanging out and listening to the music. It's like the music is so big. Well, artist. everybody in the shop loves music if they, and most of them play, uh, some don't, but uh, the other, you have, I know you have big ears, Chris. You listen to lots of different kinds of music and the guys in the, uh, the guys in the shop are everywhere from thrash metal to, to folk music. So um, it's a, it's a wonderful place to work. It's a, a lot of great people that really, 
really a great craftsman and um, really loved Preston and really want to continue to make great instruments. These are world-class instruments and um, we're very fortunate to have people like yourself, Chris, and Billy Strings, Molly, all the rest of the, the stars that are playing our guitars and realizing that these are special instruments and that they want to be part of it. And uh, we couldn't do it without you guys, couldn't do it without the guys at the shop and all the people out there that are loving their instruments and telling people about it. So thanks to everyone. That's the deal, man. Getting on a stage, you would like, at least speaking for myself, getting on a stage after stage, one of the easiest things or, or most important things is to have an instrument that you're comfortable with. That is just, you're used to it. You can, you know, feel it and it responds the same way. And for me, these guitars, no matter where I am, it's like, okay, the, the stages are changing. And as we know today, the stages have completely changed. We're all living our <laughs> to living rooms. Exactly. Yeah. To living rooms. Yeah. But who knew, you know, but uh, at any rate, even if I'm on the couch playing a concert on Facebook, like to have an instrument that I can grab and just know that I'm going to be in love with and play and it, it's like all connected that way. It's so cool. You, you want to play one? Oh, sure. Yeah. Let me grab uh, I was teaching on this guitar today. Somebody, I just saw some uh, comments uh, come in. I don't know if they're still hanging out, but somebody asked what's on the back of this guitar. And uh, I have a tone guard on, on both of these guitars. And it's because I love the way this guitar sounds so much that I want to hear every last centimeter of wood make its, uh, make its mark. So I just have that to keep it off the back of my body. I'm sure you've seen that in person too. But Yeah, and for people that are unaware of it, um, if you played an old vintage style guitar or one of our guitars, you know you can feel when you play the guitar, you can feel it against your body. And that's because the, the bodies are built very lightly so they'll respond easier to your playing. And part of that response comes from the back. And you can muffle it against your body and it'll take away some of that sound. So that's what that tone guard does. It pushes it away from the body, allows it to vibrate and create as much sound for him as possible. Uh, Let's hear one. First day. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, Chris, what do you look for in a guitar? Everybody, you know, everybody, every guitar is different and it brings out different kinds of music in each individual when they play them different guitars. But you're a professional. Um, what do you look for in a guitar? Uh, six strings. I know that. <laughs> okay, a body and a neck. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, that is, I, as, as funny as it sounds to say, uh, in, in the hunt for a guitar, I've heard so many words applied in so many weird ways. Like, I'll never forget 
having somebody hand me a guitar and say, you're going to like this guitar. It's very woody. And I, I looked at it and I said, well, it is all wood. No, the sound, is, the sound is woody. <laughs> I played yeah. something and the terminology didn't make any sense to me at this time, you know, many years ago, but it made instant sense. You hear it and you go, oh, I get it. So you hear all these terms, dry, woody, you know, I might use some of those. It's the warning I'm about to, to say, but um, I, I think for my sense of musicality, I really love uh, uh, evenness across. Like uh, you want it to be strong in all of the tonal spectrum in every area of it. Um, but you, you know, I don't like. I don't want a lot of, like bass overpowering treble or treble overpowering bass. But you don't want you know a lot of a lot of even vintage uh, guitars, uh, not brand specific, but even in a certain area, tend to be a little bit. I don't know if it's thinner in this area. And of course there's a lot of, you know, physics and other things involved in, in, in it. That's even beyond my pay grade, but uh, like, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you guys are doing in a, in a way to craft all the way across. Like I'll never forget playing a solo of one time I was playing this guitar at a jam session and just for fun or something, I played like a bluegrass tune and went way up here and I was playing some notes and the bass player leaned over and went, Whoa, take a break. I'm, it's killing me. And I was like, wow, it's so <laughs> up here where hardly anybody would think to play. And that's what struck me. It's like, this guitar is so even from the lowest oh. note to the highest note. It just really projects well. Um, so I'm always looking for that, an evenness, a sense of evenness across the board. Um, I think for at least specifically bluegrass music, a lot of players, myself included, are, are looking for something powerful that can be heard in a in a jam session with four other guitar players i know that the um the most common thing in, in bluegrass is parking lot picking and of course the joke is always well you want a guitar that can keep up with a banjo like a banjo killer or something and to me uh i didn't want a, a guitar that could kill banjos i wanted a guitar that could kill other guitars <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sound um and so a guitar that and then I realized I kind of go, okay, put the jokes aside. I really want a guitar that can meld with other guitars or other instruments, can really blend uh, and, and poke out when it needs to. Um, so I'm always looking for that. Like when I'm playing a guitar by myself, just playing it going, okay, this sounds good. Like I've had that happen where you've got a guitar, maybe it's not yours or something, but you're playing it and you, you play by yourself and you go, man, this thing sounds incredible. Um, and then there's that moment where you get into a jam session or on a stage and you start to play it and you go, oh, it's not as incredible as it could be. Um, and that's not something I've ever had happen with any Thompson guitar that I've played. Um, I play it solo and it sounds incredible. I jump on a stage with four or five other musicians and these guitars are always there singing. Um, and that's another kind of funny how does a guitar sing but that's another thing like I really you know you can have guitars uh, that play really cool and 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 I mean play play nicely and then sound powerful but don't have a certain sweetness to it like it's the whole package really you know mm -hmm. a really hard thing to do and I you know I'm not a builder maybe you have some commentary on this would be great um, but how you get a guitar to have the whole package from sweetness to that crush factor um, and everything has to be balanced. That's that even this balance thing that I'm looking for. You know? Well, from our end, it's, um, first of all, everything has to fit together perfectly. I mean, the nut, the saddle, the dovetail joint on the guitar, right. the, the bridge, the strings, how the strings are in the holes, the kind of bridge pins, all of those little things add up to the sound. And if any of them, just think of it as if there's anything there, it's going to soak up a little bit of the sound it incrementally it's going to take away from the the total package on the inside of the guitar it's all about the thicknessing of the top how thick it is the back and the sides the the weight of the material the stiffness of the braces um, i hand graduate all the tops so they're thicker underneath the bridge thinner out towards the edge thinner on the trebles on the base side than it is on the on the on the treble side. And then the bracing all depends on the kind of performer you are, how kind of player you are, whether or not you're a, a bluegrass style player like yourself and you want that cutting power, or if you're a finger style player and you have, you're gonna play with maybe the meat of your fingers, all those things 
will inform how I approach the uh, carving of the top and the, and the selection of the materials. Right. And the mount you take off in the way of scalloping and, and, and uh, the amount of you know, thickness or thinness of the top, the, the stiffness of the braces. For example, if you're gonna play finger style and you wanna, um, you can play with the meat of your fingers and you want a lot of uh, response from the guitar, you're gonna have to make that guitar top lighter and more responsive. And um, you're also gonna to wanna to maybe use a little softer bracing because if you use a little softer bracing, it'll take the high partials, which are those overtones that you hear on, 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 on trebly sound, um, it'll soak up some of that and create a little bit more of that woody sound you're talking about. So there's a lot of things that go into making the guitar sound that way. And for us and for myself, we usually tr start with the customer and ask them what style of playing they do. And you know, are they aggressive? Are they light? Are they sitting on the couch? Are they performers? And all those things will um, inform how I approach um, voicing the guitar and that might be some of that might be a little too technical but that's kind of what some of the things to go into making a guitar sound the way it is and sound even and responsive um, right. so a, lot of, a lot of work goes into it from nine different guys in the shop <laughs> well, yeah you're talking about all the pieces that go together you know bridge pins and saddle and all the nut slots and everything and like what an analogy for what you guys have at the shop too, all the employees working together and doing incredible things, being able to hand that communication. Like, yeah, some of those lingo ter you know, terminology is uh, not something players are used to hearing, um, but you guys have to converse in that language. And, um, and we do all have to work together to create this because, um, you know, we, we started, Preston and I started back in 2013, and there was just three of us, including him, and we've now built, I think we're up into the 600s of guitars. And we've changed things a lot. We, you know, with a CNC machine, first of all, um, things are more dialed in. All the jigs are made with a CNC machine. So all that tightness we're talking about with the guitar and the way it's made has evolved over time. So we're much more consistent with what we produce. And um, I think it creates a better product overall, too. All right, the big million dollar question, your personal opinion, mahogany or rosewood go? Both. Oh, there was a good answer. <laughs> no, they, they're different animals. They're, uh, mahogany is a much more crisp note sound. Um, yeah. You know, if you're, for example, if you're, a fink, if you're playing a flat picking fiddle tunes, um, you're gonna get really crisp notes with a, a mahogany guitar. And with an Addy top, you're gonna to get really a lot of what they call headroom. So you can play it loud and hard and it's still not gonna break up. Um, but Brazilian rosewood is the epitome of, of tone wood for a reason. And it's got all that warmth and velvety and chocolatey sound that comes along with the lower register. Um, I've had it explained to me that uh, Brazilian has all, when you play a single note, you have that fundamental note, but you have all the overtones, all the other little tones that come around it. Well, in Brazilian rosewood, it has lower overtones than most other woods. So you get that rich velvety bass with a Brazilian rosewood guitar. So that's why I say both, because they're, they're different animals. They're gonna bring out a different style of playing in you when you play them too. Right. So in, in other words, that's the, why you have both. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, <laughs> and I've noticed that. Um, and soon you know, we'll have another. Rosewood, mahogany. Yeah, I got a little bit of both. I know that deal. Well, that was funny because that's a kind of an interesting story about this particular guitar is uh, when I first got into bluegrass and flat picking, playing leads on guitar. Um, I think I, a friend of mine early on when I was a teenager handed me a D18, which is a mahogany guitar. Uh, and that's kind of what my ear went to. And then after playing mahogany guitars and soloing on it, that's what I became familiar with. And that was something that Preston Thompson said when he when he, we talked about having a guitar. I had already had this um, mahogany natural top they had already sent to me. Um, and I was playing that. But then Preston said, hey, I want to build a custom guitar for you, Chris. Um, and I think a player like you would benefit from Rosewood. And I realized 
at that moment, like this is an incredible opportunity. I would love it, but realistically, my I'm still like a hardcore uh, mahogany guy um, at that point in time. Um, and now I got to yeah both. Now I love both. <laughs> um, but you're right about that. Each each material um, serves music in a different way. But that's been a, as a player, that's been really fascinating to kind of like spend a bunch of years thinking, okay, I, I'm just into this sound of the guitar and learning to play that. Um, and then speaking musically, like it's really fun to think about, um, like the like using the tonality of a certain type of wood to influence your music. Like playing this guitar, I'm really tempted to to just I don't know if it influences me to want to play notes, let them ring just a little bit longer, which is hard to do when you're playing fast, noty, or bluegrass things. But it's still tempting, you know, and it make it just influences the music in a way, um, and really love that. So we have a little question here. Um, yes. What about, what about Sitka? And uh, is it just not that good? Well, no, that's not the case at all. A Sitka could be a really great top, and there's great vintage guitars with Sitka um, tops on them. The one little thing is that you can't build a great guitar without a great top. And they all sound different. You know, when they first come in, we'll get a batch of, of Adirondack Spruce tops in, for example, and and probably the, the favorite thing for Preston and I to do of, of all the things that happened in the shop was getting a new batch of tops in and we'd I'd sand them all to the same thickness so they're uniform and then we'd sit around and we'd tap on them and try to figure out which were the good ones and uh, you can tell because you'll have a real crisp fundamental note but you'll also have some ringing bell-like sound to it so you go through them all and you can pick out which ones are going to respond better um, you can ad address the lesser tops with different kinds of bracing and stuff. Of course, it's a long story, but um, you can have great Sitka tops too. Um, you know, it, it's just a matter of finding which ones sound the best. Um, yeah. There's another Sitka is great, more pitch pockets for sound prote projection. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. that is one of the problems with, with Sitka. It, it, and also, we, we also use another wood called Lutz spruce, which comes from British Columbia, and it's a cross between Sitka and uh, white spruce, which is great on a finger-style guitar, um, but they do have a lot of pitch pockets, so it's really hard to work around those things. If you're really wanting a guitar with a perfectly looking top, oftentimes Sitka or uh, Lutz will have those little pitch pockets in it, and they're little what look like little blems, they don't affect the sound at all, but, um, you know, it's part of the nature. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very interesting. And uh, uh, another big conversation that at uh, Builders, like we mentioned earlier, Preston Levin talking about different types of guitars as the decades go on and, and that shift, um, I guess, at the Martin factory from Adirondack to Sitka was not what it was. I mean, again, maybe sh uh, short in the car. It's a long conversation, but um, whether that was just because the materials were at hand or, or somebody said, oh, this is a new sound. Let's build them this way. Like that's kind of a well, good. a lot of the times they ran out of materials. Yeah. You know, there there's freeze are a limited resource and we're using up a lot of them. Um, and back in the day in Martin, even they ran out of Sitka, uh, they ran out of uh, Adirondack for a while and they used Sitka and they changed the bracing. Um, they did a lot of things, um, but that's part of it. It's just availability and finding the best quality material you can find and use. There was another question here about sinker mahogany. You were talking about the difference between mahogany and rosewood guitars. Um, again, there's a limited quantity of, of material out there. And so what we've been utilizing uh, and it's great material is sinker mahogany. And it comes from Central America, the usual place where like Honduras, Belize, Guatemala, those kinds of places. And uh, there's a fellow that did a little study, an interesting side note. Um, I guess they took really good records, a lot like Martin did. Um, they had records for stumpage for when they cut the material. And then they had records at the mill for what they milled. And he noticed that there was a big discrepancy between the two of them. And there were a lot more logs cut than ended up being milled. 
And so he got to thinking, well, you know, they floated him down the river, just like they did in the Northwest to the mill. Maybe they sank. So he went and he started looking at flood records. And he noticed as that was going on, there were more and more floods. And the result was he realized there's a lot of logs at the bottom of the river. So he's been pulling out logs and not, not just him, but others uh, right. pulling the, and they've been preserved in that water. But they also, there's also some things that go on on a cellular level when water, when they've been in water for a long time. And um, sinker mahogany sounds different than regular mahogany. It's, it's a little richer sound. It's got a little more punch to it. And I don't know how much of it has to do with the water, how much of it has to do with was it old growth material back then? Were there different subspecies of trees they were cutting back then? There's a lot of ribbon grain in it. Um, there's a lot of reasons it could be, but the bottom line is sinker mahogany is a great uh, tone wood, and we use it a lot. Yeah.